Coming up in today's newscast, Israel and Hamas inch closer to a ceasefire agreement, Iran reports a major cyber infiltration, and an Israeli startup reveals an incredible ultrasound innovation that allows technicians to examine patients remotely. The Gaza border has been relatively quiet over the past few days as Palestinian sources report significant progress in ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas. Egyptian and UN officials have been brokering talks between the two parties as they attempt to come to an agreement. Israel is increasing the influx of Qatari aid and fuel into Gaza and has announced plans to expand the Palestinian fishing zone. As a result, the available electricity running through Gaza has been increased from an average of four hours a day to eight hours and almost 24 hours per day in some areas. Additionally, Qatari financial aid will be allowed to fund the salaries of Palestinian public employees, including those that had been cut as a result of the Palestinian Authority's attempts to bring Hamas and Gaza in line. As a result, the number of Palestinian rioters along the Gaza border, as well as the frequency of incendiary kite and balloon attacks, has drastically decreased. Although the attacks have not ended completely, and Hamas stated that it does not intend to end the March of Return protests, some progress has been made. Meanwhile, Egyptian officials are scheduled to visit Gaza again today, followed by a trip to Ramallah to speak with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Yesterday, he met with Omani Foreign Affairs Minister Yusuf bin Alawi, who reportedly gave Abbas a letter from Oman's Sultan Qaboos bin Said al Said, which discussed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to the Gulf state last week. New reports show that Iranian infrastructure and strategic networks have been targeted by a new and advanced computer virus this week. Iranian officials have not revealed the extent of the damage, but according to Israel's Khadashot News, Iran admits to having faced a cyber attack similar to the infamous Stuxnet virus, which targeted Iran's nuclear infrastructure. However, unlike previous viruses, they claim this is more violent, advanced and sophisticated than before. This is not the first infiltration that has occurred over the past few weeks. Iranian officials have also admitted that President Rouhani's phone was tapped for an indefinite amount of time. In addition, earlier this month, Israel's Mossad intelligence agency reportedly gave Danish authorities information on a pending Iranian assassination plot. The information has since led to the arrest of an Iranian-Norwegian national, as well as the recalling of Denmark's ambassador to Tehran. On Sunday, Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei addressed the recent attacks, saying, quote, In the face of the enemy's complex practices, our civil defense should confront infiltration through scientific, accurate and up-to-date action. Israel has so far refused to discuss what role, if any, it played in these attacks. Speaking to the UN General Assembly in New York in September, Netanyahu vowed that, quote, what Iran hides, Israel will find. In other news, incoming Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro is now re-emphasizing his campaign promises to Israel. The newly elected official has declared that Israel has nothing to fear and that the Jewish state can have faith in the new Brazil, even at international forums like the UN. Joining us with more on this is Ambassador Yosef Livne. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So uh, my first question to you is, um, do you think Bolsonaro's support for Israel will pave the way for other nations? Look, I think that on the whole, Latin America is not exactly a hostile place. Uh, insofar as support for certain Israeli policies, or whatever Bolsonaro said that he would do, like moving the embassy, we'll have to wait and see. Even though there are other uh, center-right governments in the region, uh, some have uh, different policies and different positions than Israel does, or that Mr. Bolsonaro has uh, said that he holds. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. I think that his position, his uh, openly pro-Israeli position is important. If it will have a direct effect on other countries, uh, I'm not so sure. But we'll have to wait and see how he you know, interacts with his uh, colleagues in the continent to what degree Middle East is going to figure in the discussions. There are many issues that concern Latin American nations, South American nations, and the Middle East may be one of them. I don't know that it is the most important one, though. 
What do you believe is Bolsonaro's vision for Israeli-Brazilian ties? Well, I think that he views the relations with Israel as something which is important to Brazil. Brazil is a regional superpower. It's a very uh, strong nation. It has a large economy. The economic ties between Israel and Brazil are very strong. Um, we should remember that, for instance, since in December, uh, there will be new direct flights between Sao Paulo and Israel. So, yes, definitely uh, there's a lot to be said about furthering Israeli-Brazilian relations in terms of uh, commerce, in terms of culture, technology. I think he views Israeli know-how and Israeli technological prowess as something that Brazil can take advantage of. And of course, uh, will, uh, the political issues will come uh, to the foreground, I'm sure, in discussions between Israeli and Brazilian officials. And we'll try to see if Brazil adopts a more, a position which is closer to our position than it used to be in the past. How powerful do you think Brazil's voice is at the UN and other international forums? Look, Brazil is one of the founding members of the UN. It's a tradition that the Brazilian president is the first one uh, to speak when the General Assembly starts. Brazil has played an important role when uh, the petition resolution was adopted. The Brazilian foreign minister back then was the president of the General Assembly. Brazil's voice is heard. Does everyone follow its uh, position? Not necessarily. Brazil has one of the most capable foreign ministries in the world. Itamaraty, as it is known, is a very professional outfit. And uh, its diplomats are very well respected worldwide. And I think that they will have to translate the position of the president into concrete policies. We'll have to wait and see. There's a lot of controversy surrounding uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, can you talk about how this will play out? Uh, Netanyahu is going uh, to his uh, ceremony, to his initiation. Can you talk about what the controversy might imply for the future? Oh, I don't know. He has made some very outspoken uh, declarations and statements. I think that, on the whole, uh, his positions uh, what we would call right-wing positions. And uh, in, on certain issues, his positions tend to be closer to the Israeli positions rather than farther away. I think that it's an opportunity to try and build on the similarities of views between uh, the president-elect of Brazil and the Israeli prime minister, and see how we can reinforce and cement the relations even further. Well, thank you very much for your insight today. It's great you're with us. Thank you very much for having me. Moving on, according to a federal indictment filed on Wednesday, U.S. officials have now charged the shooter of the Pittsburgh massacre, Robert Bowers, with 44 counts in what is considered to be the deadliest attack on Jews in U.S. history. Originally, prosecutors detained Bowers on 29 counts of hate crimes and firearms offenses, but that number has risen to 44. Some of the charges include counts of obstruction to exercise religious beliefs resulting in death and the use of a firearm with the intent to kill. The U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania, Scott Brady, said that the case would be presented to a federal grand jury within the next 30 days. Additionally, Brady has begun the process to gain approval from Attorney General Jeff Sessions to seek the death penalty. Bowers is currently being held in jail without bail and will appear for a preliminary hearing in federal court later today. Meanwhile, thousands of people have paid tribute to the 11 victims of the attack over the past few days, with ceremonies taking place in Pittsburgh and around the world. Survivors at the scene recall a living nightmare during the shooting spree as Bowers screamed that, quote, all Jews must die while mounting his assault. The massacre took place while congregants were gathered for a baby naming ceremony and to observe Shabbat. 
But unfortunately, this is nothing new, as anti-Semitic acts, especially from white supremacists, have been on the rise worldwide. Just this past Wednesday, only several days after the Pittsburgh attack, the walls of an Irvine, California synagogue were vandalized with the words, F Jews. Hundreds of people attended the funeral of the eight members of the Attar family, who were killed in a fatal head-on collision near the Dead Sea on Wednesday. After being struck by an oncoming SUV, the Attar family's minivan flipped over and caught fire with everyone trapped inside. The funerals for the Attar family with six children, ranging from ages 3 to 12, were held at an Atanya cemetery. Police report that the driver, a resident of Givon HaChadasha, may have been under the influence of cannabis and was possibly on his cell phone at the time of the collision. Investigators believe that he may have either accidentally strayed into the opposite lane or tried to pass another car on the two-lane road, Route 90. It's been reported that the 52-year-old suspect, who prefers to remain anonymous, has a record of over 20 traffic offenses. He's now in custody by a Beersheva court on suspicion of manslaughter, and the judge ordered for him to be held for six more days. The judge wrote that the suspicion of manslaughter is based on the fact that he may have been under the influence of drugs. There's currently a heated international debate regarding the impact of cannabis on driving. A recent U.S. report issued by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety stated that car accidents in in three states in the U.S. Uh, with legalized cannabis had a 5.2 percent increase in car crashes. And another study in 2017 found that states with legalized recreational cannabis have seen a 6 percent increase in car accidents. Israel's Environmental Protection Ministry reported on Wednesday that the 2014 oil spill in southern Israel's nature preserve is 281 million shekels in damages. The disaster occurred when a pipe burst open, pouring millions of liters of oil into a nature reserve. The event caused major environmental damage to the Arava Desert and Evrona Nature Reserve and endangered much of the region's wildlife. The report this week comes as part of the ongoing criminal investigations into the Eilat Ashkelon Pipeline Company, one of Israel's main oil distributors for what experts call the worst spill in Israel's history. The ministry stated that, quote, it must be ensured that companies that fail to protect the environment will fully bear the damages caused to the environment and the public. The government maintains a tight control over the company and their business dealings are under military censorship. Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland arrived to Israel for a four-day visit on Tuesday, for the first time since Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was elected in November of 2015. After arriving from Jordan, she immediately attended a meeting with Defence Minister Avigdor Lieberman. On Wednesday, Freeland met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, President Reuven Rivlin, Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein, and opposition head Sipi Livni. Speaking at a press conference with Netanyahu, she began by paying tribute to the victims of the attack of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. She then discussed Canada's strong relationship with Israel over the past 70 years, noting that Canada hosts the fourth largest Jewish community in the world. Freeland also made a special mention of Netanyahu's involvement and Israel's exceptional work in rescuing approximately 800 White Helmet volunteers and their families from Syria in July. Netanyahu stated that Canada and Israel enjoy a great friendship and that he appreciates Canada's support in various international forums, as well as the fact that Canada will not establish international relations with Iran. But more than just a diplomatic mission, Freeland's visit is seen as an educational trip as she seeks to understand the strategic picture from various paradigms. Later today, she will be visiting the Palestinian Authority. Corporations and organizations are often bombarded by phone calls from satisfied and not so satisfied customers. An Israeli-based company called Bonobo AI can analyze the data collected from these phone calls. Their goal is to help companies become more equipped to offer the best customer service possible. Joining us to talk about this and the details uh, is about this exciting venture is CEO of Bonobo AI and member of the Forbes 30 under 30 list, Efrat Rappaport. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So uh, what exactly is uh, Bonobo AI and how does it work? So Bonobo AI is a conversational intelligence platform. So what does it mean? We help companies understand their customers better by analyzing what their customers are saying. So we capture every single phone call, every single email, every single uh, chat stream, and we translate these um, textual data streams into insights that help these you know, companies understand their customers better. You know, why, why is this important? So some of our customers have tens of thousands of calls every day. 
Now imagine a website. You want to measure, for example, how many people click on, on that specific product and then how many of them continue to the cart and, and pay. But how do you do that you know, in, in human conversations? And this is where we come into the picture and help. Oh, that's fascinating. So, so what happens after you collect all this data and then you have all of the charts and logarithms? What, what do you do with this information? So we employ AI to analyze this data and surface insights. And um, we do it, it in, in two different ways. So one way is uh, we essentially serve as an antivirus for human conversations. So we're always there. We listen to everything customers are saying. And we would be able to tell you out of thousands of conversation, fo conversations focus on this specific call, these five seconds, this customer is uh, threatening to uh, sue the company. Or that specific call, these 10 seconds, uh, th this customer is um, threatening to go out to social media if you don't solve his or her problem until tomorrow morning. And these are real stories. But then we also uh, look for positive things. So we can, for example, um, tell our customers, here there, there's this um, product feedback that keeps coming up in conversations and you should know that this, this matters. Or um, when you try to sell, that specific question comes up very often and when it comes up, you tend not to close the deal. So we can help you find a better um, you know, response to that question. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So there's a fine line here between um, <laughs> artificial intelligence and invasion of somebody's <laughs> personal phone call. So if somebody's making a phone call to a company and they're both being monitored by this system, I mean, at what point, how far can you actually go to retrieve information? So the recording systems always notify the um, consumer that this call is being recorded and might be monitored for you know, quality assurance purposes, and we actually help our customers to ensure that um, your personal data is protected. So we can flag the fact that you mentioned your um, credit card number or something personal and then delete this data so it's not being used. I see. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. So how can a company find out about uh, your organization and, and actually employ it into their uh, so um, the best place would be to start in our website. It's www.bonobo, B-O-N-O-B-O.ai, and we would be happy to help from there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, being here with us today. Thank you for having me. During the Holocaust, Auschwitz prisoner David Olere was assigned the treacherous and traumatic job of disposing bodies at the Nazi death camp. From the horrors he witnessed and experienced, Olere found a way to rise up from the pain and express himself visually. Over the years, he's created an array of incredibly moving and haunting artwork. Now over 90 of his pieces are on display in the exhibition at the Auschwitz Memorial and Museum in Poland. Born in Warsaw in 1902, David Olere was a French Jew of Polish descent. He studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in the Polish capital before being arrested in 1943 and then deported to Auschwitz. While at the concentration camps, he was part of a special unit of male Jewish prisoners chosen by the Nazis to discard bodies of those who had perished in the gas chambers. Olere documented the unimaginable cruelty that he witnessed in the form of paintings and drawings, which depict what his eyes tragically captured. The exhibition is named David Olere, the one who survived crematorium three. Olera's grandson describes him as being a very tough, talented, and traumatized man, saying that he painted so that later generations would be aware of the horrors that he had witnessed. The exhibition will run until March. While ultrasound examinations are dynamic and in real time, the doctor who provides the diagnosis is rarely present in the room during the exam. This often means the loss of critical data, or it could mean patients need to come in for follow-ups. So this is where imaging comes in. ILTV correspondent Doriel Mizrahi is here to tell us more about it. Thanks, Yael. So imaging stands for innovative imaging, and today most scans are done by technicians. So the radiologist usually isn't there and isn't present, and he views later recorded images or video clips instead of seeing the full real-time picture. But as you mentioned, the result is that doctors may miss something important or send the patient for repeat ultrasounds or even more costly invasive diagnostic imaging. 
It's very interesting. So how exactly does imaging work? Yeah, okay, so their technology will enable physicians to manipulate captured ultrasound video and perform a virtual dynamic exam without the patient being present. Let me try to explain how this works. Ultrasound is created by many frames, so essentially all the data exists and is there, but cannot be seen. So imaging takes the video apart and builds it again so doctors can navigate inside and see everything that's going on and gives them a 3D model to maneuver through, which is super cool. So uh, do doctors already have this equipment in their offices? Okay, so the startup completed its first investment round within only 100 days from angel investors and doctors, and they're planning to be ready for commercialization in one year. Um, and this technology is currently patented in the U.S. and the European Union, so they're really working as hard as they can to get this out in the market and available for physicians ASAP. So it's fascinating. Uh, medical technology is such an innovative field, and uh, I look forward to seeing more Israeli startups yeah. and learning about their breakthroughs. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Yael. Music lovers in Tel Aviv have a lot to be excited about. The five-day tune-in music conference and showcase is underway. This is their annual event that features many of Israel's most well-known bands and up-and-coming artists who will perform at dozens of bars, venues, and theaters throughout Tel Aviv. Over the next four days, there will be panels and discussions by some of the biggest players in the music industry, including Grammy-winning producers, songwriters, and delegates from major record labels such as Warner Music and Sony. There are collaboration nights, networking events, and parties all week long. This conference has been compared to the South by Southwest Music Festival in the U.S. The founders say that the goal is to connect musicians with industry professionals from around the world. There will be performances by the alt-pop band Bear Dreams, the African jazz trio Liquid Saloon, the Shai Khazan Jazz Quintet, electro soul artist Shira, the post rock electronic band Solar Wind, and the electronica dance producer Elon Bluestone. So don't miss out on your chance to participate. The conference with industry leaders will take place this Friday, November 2nd, at Tel Aviv's Lighthouse Hotel. And now for the top five of this week with ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh. For anyone coming to the Holy Land for the first time, part of your initial culture shock may have something to do with the weekly schedule. Sundays start the week, Fridays are half days, and then from late Friday afternoon through Saturday or Shabbat, most things are closed. Well, I'm here to give you guys ILTV's top five list of amazing things to do in Israel on Shabbat. Up first on the list are the amazing museums of Israel. Now, not all of them are open on Shabbat. However, the Israeli Museum, which you should definitely not miss, is open on Saturdays. Along with the Children's Museum in Hulon, which is also open on Shabbat and offers unique interactive exhibits for anyone and everyone to enjoy. What better way to spend your Saturday afternoon than a good cultural museum visit, right? Second up, most tourists coming to Israel are looking to try the unbelievable Israeli food, but kosher restaurants are closed during Shabbat. However, to your surprise, tons of chef restaurants are open in Jerusalem on Shabbat and offer you some of the best dishes in the country. There are also tons of restaurants open in Tel Aviv as well that offer delicious local flavors and ingredients. So don't be worried about Shabbat. You can still dine Holy Land style. Third on the list are bars. Just like in fine dining, there are endless options for upscale bar experiences on the weekends in Israel, such as the classy speakeasy spot the Gatsby Cocktail Room in Jerusalem. And you have to check out the Imperial Cocktail Bar in Tel Aviv for an out of this world craft cocktail experience. If you're looking for a fun way to let loose and enjoy your Shabbat. Fourth on our list is taking a boutique winery tour in the Galilee. You can spend your weekend in an award-winning family-run non-kosher winery such as Chateau Golan, a soft winery, and many more. Just grab your car and head over to the Tuscany of Israel. Last, but of course not least, the crazy idea of spending Shabbat as Shabbat. You don't have to put a religious twist to it. In a world filled with smartphones, social media, and constant contact, the concept of observing Shabbat is intended to disconnect, turn all electronics off, and have a day with yourself or your family. Nothing wrong with taking a literal day off from the world. And who knows, maybe you'll enjoy it more than you think. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, Israeli startup Inijing just had an ultrasound breakthrough. So of course, our word of the day is pritza, which means breakthrough. A breakthrough or pritza is a sudden or important discovery or development. This past year in Israel, there have been various breakthroughs or pritzot in a multitude of fields. For example, there's been a compound that disables cancer cells, an artificial cornea, the world's first lab-grown bone implant, and many more remarkable advances. Israel has been at the forefront of scientific breakthroughs, pritzot, for a very long time, and hopefully there will be many more pritzot in the future. 
Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be mostly clear and warm with a low of about 67 or 19 degrees Celsius. Then over the weekend, you can expect sunny skies and a slight drop in temperatures to a high of around 87 or 29 degrees Celsius. That's all for today's newscast. Today's exchange rate is 3.71 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for the daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter, ILTV News. I'm Yael Shear, and thanks for watching.